Hey everyone, let's continue talking about Newton's law of universal gravitation. So last time we talked about the magnitude of the force there, which is dependent on the product of the masses divided by their distant, the distance between them squared. And that constant of proportionality is Newton's gravitational constant, which I listed there. We talked about how gravity is universal, meaning that all masses attract every other masses, uh, all other masses. So if m1 is pulling on m2 in this direction, then m2 is pulling on m1 in this direction there. And that's true for uh, any two objects that have mass. Now this time we're going to get a little more precise and talk about Newton's law in its vector form. We're going to talk about extended bodies. So this here, uh, this picture, um, M1 and M2 are point masses, and um, we'll talk about extended bodies a little bit more. Then we'll talk about gravity near the Earth's surface, or little g, and what uh, what affects it. And we'll talk about gravitational fields. And fields are just a really important concept in physics. This is just the first time that you'll be introduced to a field, but they will come up again and again uh, in physics 1, 2, and 3. So. Here is what Newton's law of universal gravitation will look like in its vector form. Okay. This is probably the best way to, um, to remember it. So the force on mass 1 by mass 2 is going to be minus gm1 m2 over the distance between them squared. And the direction here is going to point in this minus r2 1 hat direction. Now, uh, just by way of notation, so r2 1 is the displacement vector pointing from m2 to m1. Okay, now displacement doesn't always mean that something starts in some location then finishes up in some location. Uh, that's the way that we talk about it in where the way that it comes up in kinematics very often, but Displacement can really just be any uh, vector that gives you uh, a separation uh, between two endpoints in in space. So uh, if R two one, so R two one here is this displacement vector from M two to M one. R two one hat is the unit vector pointing along that vector. So if I take R2, 1 and divide it by its magnitude, then I will have a unit vector. So it just gives me the direction that it's pointing uh, rather than the full thing, right? So this here is just, this is a unit vector. It has length 1. And uh, oh, one more reminder. So I wrote r21, right? That's a shorthand for taking the length of the vector r21. So these are important things um, to remember. They'll, they'll come up a few times. Um, and so what this is telling us then is if you want the force on mass 1 by mass 2, it's going to point in this minus r21 hat direction. So r21 points in this direction. Right, and I could pick this vector up and lift it over here, right? It still has the same magnitude. It still has the same direction. It just changed the location. So it's the exact same vector, right? And you won't be surprised to find that F, that the force on mass 1 by mass 2 is in the minus R2 1 hat direction. So that would be in this direction here. That is minus R2 1 hat. Okay. So the force on mass 1 is going to obviously point towards mass m2. This is nice because it gives us one single equation for all parts of the gravitational force, not just the magnitude, but also the direction. Now let's do an example problem and we'll show why this, this form that might just look a little bit more confusing to you right now because there's so many more indices here is actually going to be helpful in many cases. So just, just, remember, um, just remember two things, right? There's this minus sign here and that represents uh, 
that gravity is a, an attractive force. And the other thing is that these indices here are flipped around. This is force on one by two. This is unit vector pointing from two to one. All right, let's do an example problem then utilizing this vector form. So let's say there's three objects of equal mass that are located at three corners of a square of edge length L. Find the gravitational force on the lower left, oh, it should be the lower right mass, right, the one on the x-axis, due to the other two objects. So here's my system. I'm going to, I want to find, I'm interested in finding the total net, uh, sorry, the net force on object one. So that would be, right, the, the object, the force on object one from object two, plus the force on object one from object three. Um, and I'm going to use uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation in its vector form. So here's what I would like. Uh, before I go and do this problem myself, I would like you to pause this video and just work out what are these four vectors here? What is R21? What is R31? What is R21 hat and R31 hat? And uh, give them their precise mathematical expression, just work it out yourself, and then you can come back and hit play. Okay, so I'm just going to assume that you've done that. Now, R21 is this vector pointing in this direction, R21, and R31 is this vector here, right? And R21 is going to be, it goes down in the y direction, a distance L, and it has no x component whatsoever. So this is going to be just minus L j hat, or y hat would be fine too. Um, let's just separate this from that so that we don't get confused. And R31 is going to be, it goes down in the y-axis, a distance L, and it goes to the right, a distance L as well. So plus L in the i-hat direction. Right, of course, normally we put the i component first and the j-hat component second, but mathematically they're, they're exactly the same. Now, what is r21-hat then? Well, r21-hat is r21 divided by its length. Okay, the length of R21 is just, uh, it would be the root of the sum of the squares of each of the components. There's only one component, so its length then would be L. So I would have minus L j hat over L. In other words, it's pointing in the minus j hat direction. And what about r hat 3 1? Well, that would be r 3 1 divided by the magnitude of the vector. So that would be l i hat minus l j hat. And it would be divided by root l squared plus minus l squared, right? In other words, this would be. So the, the inside of this root would be 2L squared. If I take the square root of that, I would get root 2L. So if I then divide the top and bottom of the components by root 2L, those Ls would go away, and I would just have 1 over root 2 I hat minus 1 over root 2 J hat. Now, if I'm doing the math too quickly because I'm skipping some intermediate steps. You can always pause the video and work it out yourself. It's really important in physics one that you get used to working with vectors. They're going to come up a lot. So now that I have these uh, vectors, I can put them into my form formalism for Newton's laws. So F12 is going to be minus G M1 M2 over r21 squared r21 hat. 
Okay, remember there's a minus sign and the indices are switched around. So R2 1 hat um, is minus J hat, right? And M1 and M2 are both just M. And R2 1, the length of this vector, right, we already found it over here, was just L. So plugging all those values in, I have that this is minus G M times M over L squared. And R21 hat is in the minus J hat direction. Great. Now F13, the force on mass 1 by mass 3, is going to be minus G M1 M3 over R31 squared R31 hat, which is going to be, well, the minus G and the M times M is going to be all the same. R31, the length of the vector, remember we found that down here. Um, it was root 2L in the, in the denominator here. That was R31. So if I square that, that would just be 2L squared in the denominator. And R31 hat is 1 over root 2 i hat minus 1 over root 2 j hat. So I then have my two vectors and I can just take and add those together to get the total force vector on mass 1. So F1 is going to be um, this, uh, this F12 here, plus this there. So both of them, you'll notice, have an M squared in the numerator and an L squared in the denominator and a minus G out front. So I'll just take those out right away. Minus G, M squared over L squared. That's common to all of them. And then I can sum the other parts that haven't been accounted for there, which would be just minus j hat for f12, plus over here there was a one half factor and the unit vector part, which was one over root two i hat minus one over root two j hat. Okay. Now let's just simplify. So basically I'm done here, um, but let's simplify this a little bit. So I can take this and do, um, let's distribute the minus through and then simplify uh, here the unit vector. So this is going to be G M squared over L squared times, there's a positive J hat if I'm distributing that minus through. And I'll distribute then the minus and the one half through here. So that would give me a minus one over two root two i hat and a plus one over two root two j hat. So finally, I should take the components and um, take these two j components and put them together and I would get G M squared over L squared times minus one over two root two I hat plus one plus two root so two root two J hat. Okay, so that's my final answer. Now let's just check this uh, check this out on our diagram and just see if this if this makes sense. So, first of all, it totally makes sense that this force vector would be dependent on mass squared and on length squared, given that the dimensions here scale with L, and uh, the masses are all the same. 
So since gravity is, uh, is proportional to the product of the masses, if the masses are the same, this should depend on m squared. If the whole system scales with L, then, and gravity is one over the distance squared, then there should be an L squared in the denominator. Both of those things make sense. And also, which way would this thing point? Well, it would be in the minus x direction, and it would be in the plus y direction. So here, I'll get a blue for my force vector. So it would be in the minus x direction and in the plus y direction. And the y component, say it would be larger, the y component would be larger than the x component. Right? And that makes sense as well because there's two things pulling it up, right? And only one pulling it uh, to the left at all. So the fact that the y component is larger than the i component makes sense. And the overall direction in which it's being pulled also makes sense. So this passes all of my sanity checks. Um, this looks like a good answer. All right. Let's move on and talk about gravity and extended objects. The first thing to say is that um, there's, so long as you're not, say, within an extended object or considering the density inhomogeneities of, a, of a, an extended object, then they're really not that much different from talking about two point masses that are located, that have the same mass as extended bodies, but where all of the mass is located at a point right at the center of mass of the objects. So if I have, say, Saturn here and Earth there, it wouldn't matter if there's these extended bodies, uh, or if I were to take the Earth's mass, mass crush it down right to a point uh, at the center of mass of the Earth, and Saturn's mass and crush it down right to a point at the center of mass of Saturn. The force the forces on the two planets would be exactly the same. Okay. Now, now let's talk about um, a spherical shell. So this might sound very hypothetical, a spherical shell of mass, but this uh, does have practical consequences. So if you have a spherical shell, and you're looking at the force, say, on some object outside of that shell, it would be exactly the same as if there were a point mass m located right at the center of that shell with the same mass. Okay, so same thing that I had said about the extended bodies, right? Um, but if you take that particle and then put it inside of that shell of spherical mass, uh, the gravitational force would be zero. And that's not just saying, you know, if it were right, located right at the center, that it would be zero. No, anywhere inside would be zero. And it's a kind of a complicated mathematical proof to do, but you can just kind of think about it. If the thing is offset to the side, then yes, it's, uh, you might be tempted to think that there's a net force in this direction because it's closer over here. But really, um, even though this is closer, the stuff over here, there's more mass over here. This mass, this part, this portion uh, over here on this part of the circle is farther away, but there's more of it, right? So uh, it turns out when you do the mathematical proof here that this effect from this more uh, this larger amount of mass that's farther away ends up perfectly balancing this mass here, which is, say, closer together, closer to the object, but there's less of it. Um, so when a particle is inside a thin spherical shell, then it's gra the gravitational force is going to be zero. And remember here, we, we are talking about something of uniform density. Now... What's interesting about this is that any sphere then can be modeled as a series of thin shells. And then the contribution from something outside then uh, would be canceled out. And it acts then as if uh, 
the only mass that is left, or the only mass that has any effect, is going to be the mass interior to um, a person's location. So let's just, that sounds very abstract, let's do a, a specific concrete example. Okay. How would your weight change if you were in a cave that's one-tenth of the Earth of Earth's radius below the Earth's surface? This is an interesting problem. So here you are, you're this yellow person, and you are uh, embedded within the Earth. Um, you are one-tenth of the way below the Earth's surface. Now, what would be the weight, uh, what would your weight be? Well, there's two, you can think of this as you're being pulled by two separate, uh, two separate objects. One, that's the interior here, and another, that's this external shell located out here, right? Now, since the external shell is all taken to be outside of of you, say you're sitting, you know, on the you're with your center of mass right there, um, then the net effect from this external spherical shell is going to be zero. Uh, the this whole outside portion here is going to have a net zero effect. So the only thing that will actually pull on you is that the yellow part, uh, interior to where you are, and the yellow part will pull on you, exert a force that is exactly the same as if there was a point mass right at the center with the mass of the yellow stuff, right, located right in the very, very center location. So the effect would be exactly the same uh, as if there was a point mass that had just this interior, just the mass of this interior portion, uh, and it was located right at the center of the Earth. So here we're, we're taking the approximation that, that the Earth is spherically symmetric, which is a very good approximation. Uh, when you consider like the global properties of the Earth. There's lots of inhomogeneities in for the Earth, but it's not like they're, um, uh, it's not like they're all, you know, in one location and not in another. Okay, let's work this out. How would your weight change? Well, your weight, right, would be, uh, would be um, minus G, m1, m2 over the distance squared, okay? Um, and it would point in the minus y hat direction, right? So it would point, this is positive y hat, it would point down. Now, m1, say, would be your mass and M2 would be the mass of the Earth, but just the yellow part. Your distance, R21, would be, say, nine-tenths of the Earth's radius, because you're supposed to be one-tenth of the Earth's radius down below. So this distance here is supposed to be one-tenth of the Earth's radius, and this distance here is supposed to be nine-tenths of the Earth's radius. I know I didn't draw the scale very well. Okay. So, we would have, we could put this as minus g, your mass, we'll just say your mass, uh, the mass, your mass is just m. Uh, m2 is going to be, right, this mass of the yellow part over, well, the distance squared is going to be right, 9 tenths of the Earth's radius squared in that y hat direction. Now, what is m yellow? What is the mass uh, inside of your location? Well, 
your one tenth Earth radii below. Uh, you have one tenth tenth of Earth radii worth of Earth above you, and nine tenths uh, below. So, um, if we're assuming that the that we have a spherical symmetry, um, and then we can say, well, the mass of yellow part is going to be right, um, proportional to the a ratio of how much volume there is inside of your location to how much volume there is in total times the mass of the earth, right? So basically we can say it's the mass of the earth times the volume ratio, right? So the volume, say, the yellow part divided by the volume of the total, the total volume of the Earth. So the volume is going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, there's going to be a factor of 4 thirds pi in the numerator and the denominator. So the only thing that will actually end up mattering is the cubed ratio, uh, or the cubed radii. So I would have a 9 tenths re in the numerator cubed and an re cubed in the denominator representing right the volume interior on the top here and uh, for the whole earth on the bottom part so what i have then is this would be the mass of the earth times nine tenths to the third power take this and I will plug it in there and I would get that this is equal to I'm running out of room here I can take this and I end up with force of gravity equals now I'm just going to simplify this uh, this expression here. There's a nine thirds to the third power in the numerator, and uh, sorry, a nine tenths to the third power in the numerator, a nine tenths squared in the denominator. So that just leaves me with a nine tenths single factor uh, of nine tenths uh, overall times right minus g m uh, mass of the earth square mass over the radius of the earth squared y hat. All right, now notice that this factor here is just the weight that you would have at the surface. So if you were sitting, you know, up here. And this is different than by a factor of 9 tenths. So uh, to answer the question, how would your weight change if you were in a cave that's 1 tenth Earth radii below the Earth's surface? Well, the force of gravity at say, 9 tenths Earth radii is just 9 tenths of the force of gravity at the surface of the Earth. So it would decrease, your weight would decrease by 10%. So you might be wondering then, uh, if the weight is 9 tenths of what it would be on the surface, when you're inside of this cave. Does that mean that the freefall acceleration is also different? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Yes, it would be different. The freefall acceleration, if you were in this cave dropping something to the ground, would be about 9 tenths of the normal freefall acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, the explanation of why G has this value can be found using Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian law of universal gravitation. So uh, we've talked about gravitational forces or weights uh, in two different contexts, right? There was this chapter three context where uh, the force of gravity is just mass times little g. And we also talked about it now in the chapter six context where we have uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. But these two things are, of course, the same. So if you set them uh, to be equal to one another, you can cancel out mass, and you'll see that g 
This is the 9.8 meters per second squared free fall acceleration. It is set by this these properties of the Earth, right? The mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth squared, as well as the Newtonian gravitational constant. So that's what gives the Earth this particular value for the free fall acceleration. So when that interior mass gets uh, changed here and the distance between you and the center of mass of the Earth changes because you're down inside of this cave, g will also change. Well, let's talk a bit then about what affects g. g can change with altitude, right, because altitude will change this distance between the object and its, um, and its center of mass. Uh, it has a weak dependence on altitude. g will be different for different planets. It will always depend on this factor of mass over distance squared. Uh, g can change at different points along the Earth's surface because sometimes uh, the Earth's surface is higher up uh, in certain places than it is in other places. And also, um, the acceleration due to gravity can change because of, say, density in homogeneities. So uh, if you're standing above something, um, some spot that is has less dense material underneath your feet, say you're standing above a large reservoir of oil or something, then G will be a little bit less uh, than it would be otherwise. This is actually one of the ways that you can uh, find large reservoirs of oil. Now, here, let's do an example problem. So if you doubled the mass and tripled the radius of a planet, by what factor would G at its surface change? Why don't you pause the video and work on this one yourself for a minute? Okay, I'll assume that you've done that. Let's solve this problem together then. So, um, so if you doubled the mass and tripled the radius, by what factor would g at its surface change? Well, g is uh, g m over r squared, right? If we took this and it did made this change, doubling the mass, tripling the radius, this would go from gm over r squared to, say, g2m, doubled the mass, tripled the radius, so 3r squared. Or, in other words, this would be g times 2m over 9r squared. So you see this is just 2 ninths times big G um, R squared, the thing that we started with over there. So G decreases by a factor of 2 ninths. A little bit more about gravity near the Earth's surface. So here, this question, which I won't go through in detail, but just very quickly, uh, asks about the effective value of G on the top of Mount Everest, which is uh, 8,850 uh, meters above sea level. Um, how would this change? Well, G does have a weak dependence on elevation. It's not a strong one, but there is uh, some dependence. So here would be G at sea level. And here would be G, say, on top of Everest, right? Where this distance between you and the center of the Earth is now not just the radius of the Earth, but also this appreciable distance H above the Earth. Uh, you can see, right, that distance H is still small compared to the radius of the Earth, but it does have a, an appreciable effect. Uh, so the dependence on altitude is fairly weak. But if you're in an extreme location like Mar Mount Everest that's very high up above the Earth, then um, H will, will not be uh, negligible. And so on top of Everest, you end up, when you plug in these numbers, you end up with a GE that's about uh, 9.77 meters per second squared. Um, so there's a few different factors then that can affect G. So altitude, uh, as we just discussed, the local geology, meaning like the density of basically what's underneath your feet 
uh, will affect things. And also the shape of the Earth, uh, because the Earth is not quite spherical, right? It's, it's spinning. And because it's spinning, uh, it gets kind of flattened out, right? You could imagine if it was spinning a thousand times faster than it actually is, it would kind of get squashed like a pancake. It would get really flattened out. Um, but uh, it's not that extreme. But uh, you could see here, right, the, the equator, uh, you get a G of about 9.78, whereas at the North Pole, um, its G, G is about 9.83. So um, you're a little bit closer to the center of mass of the Earth uh, when you're at the North Pole than you are when you're out here uh, at the sides uh, or at the equator. Um, also, right, high elevation means uh, lower G, right? So here's Denver, Denver, Colorado, 9.796 uh, meters per second squared would be the value of G. Interesting that, so in Denver, uh, or in uh, Colorado in general is where it's like some of the farthest home run hits have been made and stuff. Um, there's probably a small impact uh, there because of G, uh, but I think the bigger effect is that the atmosphere is thinner. There's less air, uh, less drag on, an, on a baseball uh, at high elevation. Finally, let's talk about the gravitational field. Now, the gravitational field is just one of many different types of fields that we have in physics. There's electric fields. There's magnetic fields. They're really important for for uh, physics. They're, they're really a, a fundamental concept, the, the concept of a field. Okay, so let's just talk about the gravitational field. Um, the gravitational field is a gravitational force per unit mass. Okay, um, and the gravitational field uh, due to, say, a single mass m would be then minus gm over the distance squared, right? And that goes radially inward. Um, so let's just think about... Um, why it makes sense to talk about fields for a second. So earlier we talked about the, uh, we, we did a problem, right, where you were below the ground, and we had talked about how the free fall acceleration was less up there. And then we talked about um, if you were on top of Mount Everest, right, what is the free fall acceleration, say, up at this point here. But, um, you might notice that the free fall acceleration at this location and at this location has nothing to do with, like, what object you drop, right? It's independent of which object gets dropped. The only thing that is, um, that, that matters for that quantity, the free fall acceleration at each one of those points, is the influence that the Earth itself has at each one of those points, right? So it would make sense to have a quantity that we could talk about that describes the influence of gravity from some source, uh, some source of a gravitational pull at different locations. And yet we can't really talk about measuring weights and stuff like that unless there's something there located at that location that we can measure its force on, right? So once we put a mass here, then we can have a force of gravity on there, and we can talk about, you know, the gravitational influence on, uh, on this specific body. But if we just want to focus in on the location and not on the object itself, what we can do is define the force of gravity on the object and then divide by its mass. So that we end up with a quantity that only depends on the gravitational influence at a given location, and it has nothing to do with the mass of the particular object. Okay, so if you plug in uh, for this, this uh, force of gravity, Newton's uh, law of universal gravitation, uh, what you'll see is that, right, there'll be a minus gmm in the numerator, and that little m will get canceled out, right, so that just the mass of the planet itself is left there. And um, so you'll have a minus gm over r squared uh, with this unit vector, right, pointing radially outward from the center of the body. So what we have then is the, uh, is the gravitational field at that distance, and this is a measure of the influence 
of the Earth's gravity at that point, the strength of the Earth's or of the uh, the planet's gravitational field at that given location, and it doesn't depend on you know the fact that there is a mass there. So I can, if I want to know the weight that any object would have at that location, I can just multiply its mass times this gravitational field vector g. All right, almost done. Let's just talk about then how you would calculate the gravitational field from a bunch of different sources. So let's say you're interested in the gravitational field at some point p, and the, there are sources of many sources of a gravitational field here, right? The, the sun is the source of a field, the earth is the source of a field, and so is the moon, say. Um, well, what you would do is you would calculate each of these individual uh, gravitational fields, the one sourced by the sun, the earth, and the moon, at that point P, right? So that would involve the distance between the sun and P, the distance between the earth and P, the moon and P, and they would each have their own different uh, unit vectors as well, right? And then you would take the vector sum of those three to find the net gravitational field at that point P. And then say you wanted to launch a satellite up uh, into point P later on and you were interested in what the force of gravity is on the satellite, well, it's just the mass of the satellite times that net gravitational force at that location P. Okay. Last thing to say about G, uh, about um, the gravitational field vector, is that uh, you might have noticed that uh, it's, it's very closely related to the free fall acceleration G. Uh, and the reason why, so they, they are exactly the same mathematically speaking. The free fall acceleration G is just the magnitude of the gravitational uh, field force. They have different connotations in that the gravitational field is something that we think of as surrounding a, a planet, right? It surrounds it and it's pointing radially inwards, right? It has this mathematical form right here. And we think of the free fall acceleration uh, in a different context is where we kind of zoom in on one specific location. And then this radially inward becomes right, the negative y direction. So that's why free fall acceleration y would be, you know, minus g. Um, so when you zoom in really close, uh, of course, that radially in becomes just straight down. So uh, just to show for a second that the, the units are the same, now g is calculated using uh, Newtonian's gravitational constant times a mass divided by a distance squared. So that would be... Uh, units of newton meter squared per kilogram squared for g times units of kilograms for mass uh, divided by meters squared for the radius. But I can cancel out meters squared there with meters squared there, and the kilograms that comes from mass will cancel out with the kilograms in the denominator of g, and I end up with newtons per kilogram. Right? Not that surprising considering that it was originally defined in terms of a force per unit mass. And uh, remember, though, that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So plugging that in, uh, the kilograms would cancel out, and you just have that g is also in meter, units of meters per second squared. So the gravitational field vector, then, by u is your kind of standard 9.8 meters per second squared, and it would be pointing straight down below your feet. All right, I hope you found that helpful. Good luck doing your gravity problems on your homework and in future exams. For anybody in my class, I love to ask questions about gravitational fields and gravitational forces in their vector form.